morning, everybody. Let's stand together. Sing about his love. Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? Sing this out. You are the Lord. You are the Lord Almighty. Every voice. I'm shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Creation calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. Yeah, our God of wonders, you reign. What is you reign? You are. You are the Lord Almighty. I'm shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. You are the Lord Almighty. I'm shining all the stars. In glory, your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Not to us, but to your name, we lift up. All praise, not to us, but to your name, we lift up all praise, not to us, not to us, but to your name, we lift up all praise, not to us, but to your To your name, the name of Jesus, we lift up all praise. Not to us, not to us, but to your name. Yes, Lord, we lift up all praise. Not to us, but to your name, we lift up all every voice. You are the Lord. in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares you are the Lord almighty outshining all the stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares Yes, Lord. Thank you for your love, Lord. We bless your holy name. We bless your name, God, and we thank you that we can be in this tent, Lord, 
one more week giving you praise and worship in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Pastor Bob, come on up. Hey, it has been great to be in the tents this summer, hasn't it? We want to thank uh, the worship team for all that they've been doing, getting everything out here. And all those folks that have been helping set up and tear down. Oh, by the way, they have to move all this stuff into the sanctuary today. And if you want to help after the service, I think they'd take that. Hey, it's been great being out here. We want to thank you for your faithfulness, coming out, being here. Praise God, the tents and the rental fees for them have been covered completely from you folks, so thank you. But now we look forward to going back inside to the sanctuary next Sunday, September 6th. We'll be inside with services at 8.30 and 10.30. 8.30. Yeah. Just ask Ruth to wake you up. Pastor Bob will call you. Yeah. I think there are a few others that you're up at like 4:30 in the morning. So, if Ray can do it, you can do it. 8:30 and 10:30, starting next Sunday, and uh, we'll also continue to have an online service available at 10:30 in the mornings each week. Nurseries will start up with registration on the 13th of September. Sunday school programs will launch on September 27th. We're going to let everybody get back to school, let everybody get started, and then September 27th will launch, but with a substantial change. We will meet Sunday afternoons at 4 p.m. Because if we do it in the morning, it overloads our service times and services. So Sunday school programs will be at 4 p.m. with... um, a family class integrating Awana, student ministry, adult groups, they'll all be there. And then adult small groups for the fall will also be published starting September 20th. We're working hard to provide a safe and comfortable place reflecting New York Department of Health guidelines for each and every one of us. We realize, you know, there are about 200 of us here and there are about 300 different opinions about measure, safety measures. So. We're asking that you would care for each other and follow our provided guidelines together. To this end, the elders have set forth the following standards. One, face coverings are required during entry, exit, and while moving around in the building. Coverings can be removed once you're seated with six-foot spacing, which is marked off in the sanctuary. So as Steve says, he marked it with blue tape where you don't sit. You know, X's, don't sit on the X. And then... The sanctuary, bathrooms, nurseries, and common surfaces will be disinfected before, between, and after the services. And full details of our guidelines and our fall schedule will be out on our website, our Facebook page, on all the emails that come out from church, so you can pick them up there. You can always call the office for details. But it will open up with registration because we are limited by New York guidelines to 125 people in our sanctuary for each service. And so that you don't show up and don't have somewhere to sit, we're asking that either online through those sources or by calling into the office, you register each week for services. There will be an overflow room available for those who arrive without registering. Thank you for respecting and and showing grace to one another in all this as we go forward in ministry together, seeking to know Jesus, become more like him, and introduce others to him to God's glory, right? As we go forward. There are a lot of volunteer positions that are needed, so that'll be coming out in email as well. If you can help us out, that would be great. Um, Again, if you can help move these guys into the sanctuary, After this service, that would be wonderful. It is great to worship Jesus Christ, isn't it? Let's stand and do that this morning. Continue that.
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good. Let the king, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my.
Jesus, and he's the name above all names. He is worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. And how great. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Let's sing this church, praise the Father. Gospel truth of old shall not kneel 
Philippians says, 4.10, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord the last time you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I want you to claim that today. What is your need for Christ? What is your need? And can it be filled in Christ? And Paul says, yes, it can be. See, we don't have any lack if we know Christ. We don't have anything that we need or want because he's given us everything. He's given us salvation. He's given us hope. He's given us two big tents so we can worship him. God is able. So whatever your need is, bring it before him, bring it before the cross. Say, God, I can't handle it. I surrender it to you. Jesus, I need you every hour. Bring it before Jesus because he can handle it. I guarantee you, if he can handle a cross, sweat blood in the garden, he can handle your need. Stripes on his back. He could handle it. How sweet it is, Lord, to be in your presence today. To hear the wind whip and blow. To feel the refreshing sun on our backs warmth that it offers. We know, God, that in you, we have everything we ever need. We think of the Apostle Paul and as he was shipwrecked, almost dead, in the prison. And yet he cried out to you. He was content in all things. He knew the secret. That is Jesus. So I pray, Lord, today every woman, child, man would know the secret. That is Jesus. The one who can take away sin, washes us white as snow. King of kings, Lord of lords. That every knee will bow, every tongue will confess one day. That name of Jesus. We bless that name today. In your precious name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. As we gather together to worship next week inside, things will be a little bit different. But we are here to worship the Lord God Almighty. And that hasn't changed whether we're in a tent, whether we're in our car, or whether we're in the, what we call the sanctuary. I'd like to tell you a story of something that happened to me about 15 years ago. Um, for those of you who, who know me well, and there aren't many here who know me well, uh, I'm a bit of a jerk uh, when, it, when it comes to personality. Um, I, I really can cop a mood very, very easily. And um, this one particular weekend, my two daughters, uh, both of whom talk incessantly, and my granddaughter, who at the time we thought was diagnosed with ADHD, were coming to spend the weekend. And I had just been to a Promise Keepers event, so I'm thinking, I can handle this. 
You know, it's just, it's just a little bit of commotion. I, uh, I can get over myself for a few days. And uh, as we're sitting down for dinner, I, I said to the girls, so how long are you here? And they said, a week and a half. <laughs> and I looked at my wife, Ruth, and she looked down at her spaghetti. <laughs> it, was a, it was a Saturday night, and uh, the next day was the Lord's Day. We like to call it the Lord's Day, don't we? I said to Ruth, you know, I think I'm going to stay home from church tomorrow and spend some quality time with the Lord. Well, she saw right through that. <laughs> and, and she said, no, you're going to church with the rest of us. So we got ready to go. Uh, we got up the next morning, and it was one of those mornings where nothing was going quite right. I had to make breakfast for my two daughters. One was uh, in a wheelchair and one is developmentally disabled. And of course I dropped the toast jelly side down on the floor. And it was one thing after another. And I was getting more and more annoyed about the fact that I was going to have to go to church and be uncomfortable with this extended family here. So we got in the car and uh, my, my one daughter uh, has the, the habit of uh, popping her chewing gum. And it drives me crazy. I have, she was 50 years old when she passed away, but I never told her. She knows now. <laughs> I never told her that it drove me crazy, but she was popping her chewing gum as we're going to church. When we got to church, I got out her wheelchair. I, I took her inside, and I turned around, and I walked away. I came back outside, and I parked my car as far as I could in the back parking lot of the church. Now, you have to understand, I've been a pastor for many years, and uh, for many years, I had to sit up front in church for four services every Sunday. So when I came to Faith Baptist Church and Pastor Peter asked me to come here to this church, we kind of had a deal. I sit in the back. Um, and usually the, the, the back a pew, I wanted a little plaque put there dedicated to me. Um, <laughs> because I, I like to stay kind of out of the scene of things. I get after parking the car, I come back in, and my two daughters are in the second row to the front. <laughs> so now my mood has gone from bad to worse. I go up front, I get in the row, I look in my bulletin, and I see that we're having a special speaker coming from the Southern Baptist Seminary. Well, I lost my taste for Southern Baptist with Jimmy Swagger. And I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to come on with, thank you, Jesus. And I, I just can't handle that this morning. <laughs> the guy who was leading the songs that morning was about 110 years old. <laughs> and uh, as he's leading the songs, he was full of the joy of the Lord. He really was. And I'm like, joy this, you know. I, I don't... <laughs> The organist, we had an organist at the time, the organist was playing A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. And I love the words to that hymn, but the music is a little esoteric and ponderous. Things were not going well. When all of a sudden I feel a tap on my shoulder. It was the chairman of the Board of Elders. He said, Ray, the guest speaker isn't here. Can you preach? <laughs> And I felt the finger of God go in my side and say, gotcha. <laughs> it is amazing how quickly you can repent <laughs> going from the front of the church to the back of the church. I went to the back of the church to a back room and I said, Lord, what am I going to preach about? And God said, why don't you tell people how to get out of a bad mood? <laughs> I sat there and I had, I'm telling you, I had nothing but humiliation before God. I was humbled before God. And about two minutes before I was scheduled to go up and say, I don't know what, the guest speaker arrived. 
I stayed in the back room, what was then the, the fireside room. I stayed in the back room for the, the, the duration of his sermon. His sermon was fine, I'm sure. But I spent that half an hour that he was preaching just crying out to God and saying, I'm so sorry. This is not what worship is meant to be. We're here to worship. We're here to worship Almighty God. And Malachi, the last prophet to speak in the Old Testament, his name means my messenger, probably speaking around the time of Nehemiah, uh, give or take some years, uh, possibly the last prophet of the Old Testament era, but he certainly was a messenger. He had a very profound and prophetic message for the people of God. It was strong and forthright. There were many abuses in the practice of the religious of people and the practice of their worship. And the people were beginning to question God's honor and his love and his character. At best, they had a half-hearted idea of what it was to worship God. Now, if you read the book of Malachi, you see rebuke after rebuke after rebuke. I'm not going to focus on the rebukes. I'm going to focus on the elements that Malachi gives us for worship. What constitutes great worship? And in, in chapter 1, verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. Worship begins simply with the fundamental element of love. It's an emotion. That's why we're here. We're all here because of his love. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, we read, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And again in chapter 4, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We love because he first loved us. Emotions are a funny thing. Some people are very emotional. Uh, you know, you can tell the difference between an emotional person and an, emotional, an unemotional person by how they react to an episode of Little House on the Prairie. Um, <laughs> You know, every time Albert dies, it gets me. You know, they play the rerun over and over and over again. Um, Ruth, she just watches it, and it's, it's cool. Albert's dead. Okay, I know. It's just a show. Um, we worship with different emotions. I, get, I tend to get very excited in worship. I can't sing anymore because if I sing, I can't preach. I lose my voice. If you see me singing, I'm probably mouthing the words uh, just so nobody judges me. <laughs> um, but the wonder of his love reaches out to touch us and it touches something each time we gather. We're here because of the love of God and to respond to that love. We come together with respect and reverence. Verse 6 of chapter 1. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. Who do we worship? We do not worship some man upstairs. We worship Almighty God. And uh, sometimes we, we have to confess that our knowledge and understanding of the one that we worship is not as great, is not as exalted as it should be. In, this, in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, we have the story of King Nebuchadnezzar who was judged by God for his pride and arrogance. He was made to live like an animal for seven years. And then we read this, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. 
I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Ten times in Malachi, God calls for the honor due his name. Thirty-three times in this short book of four chapters, it mentions the Lord or God. Another 24 of those times, or 24 of those 33, it mentions the Lord Almighty, El Shaddai. We, we, we see the point that Malachi is trying to make. Worship is not about me. Worship is about God. If I have to wear a mask, it, so what? I'm here to worship God. If I have to, if I have to worship online because of concerns of my, my health, so what? I worship Almighty God. Whatever our circumstances are, we're here to worship the Creator God of the universe, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of the armies of heaven, the Lord of hosts, the Creator God Most High. And we make Him our focus as we worship. We will have a growing sense and respect and reverence for Him if we do so. Worship requires some sacrifice. You ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You placed defiled food on my altar, God said. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? The purpose of a sacrifice was to bring one's best, to offer it to God. And the people were cheating on the best. They were bringing the crippled. They were bringing the blind. You know, the old Blinky, the sheep with the one eye that couldn't see out the other. Let's sacrifice him. He's, he's on his last legs right now anyway. So they, they were bringing less than their best. That's not showing the proper respect and reverence for God. Our desire should be to be willing to sacrifice for him. King David says when, uh, when offered uh, some land uh, to, uh, to buy uh, some land to uh, offer an offering and build the temple, David says, I won't take it as a gift. I will not sacrifice to the Lord that which cost me nothing. It ought to cost us something to come here. It costs us our time. It costs us our energy. It costs us our focus. It costs us our heart. That morning I told you about, I lost that. I forgot about all of that. Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Sacrifice inevitably turns to blessing. So we offer the sacrifice of praise, even if we don't feel like it. We do it because he's God and we're not. Verse 10 of chapter 1. Oh, that you would shut the temple's doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. God wants purity of heart and purity of motivation to come from us. Doesn't he say in, Rev in Romans chapter 12, I beg you therefore, brothers, as an act of intelligent worship to give him your bodies, mind, and spirit. Give it to him. Not just on Sunday morning as I'm sitting there uh, pretending I'm singing, but every, everywhere I am, I present myself to him. And the only way to do that is to cry out to God in sincerity and say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way after everlasting. That's the way to purity of heart. That's the way that we examine ourselves. And we're going to be talking about that in a, in a few weeks, about examining ourselves. But we examine ourselves by the Holy Spirit of God in the light of the Word of God. 
instruction is an important part of worship. Chapter 2, verse 7. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. The message is meant to come from God. I was at a wedding a few years ago, and when it came for the remarks for the minister to make, she read from Winnie the Pooh. And the best advice that she could give the married couple was, was from Winnie the Pooh. And I thought, hey, you got to do better than that. When we, when we instruct, we instruct from the Word of God. We can tell a story for an illustration. I just did that a few minutes ago. We can tell a story for an illustration. But there has to be some meat. There has to be some instruction from the heart and mouth of God. The Apostle Paul says this to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And again, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. We're looking for a pastor uh, for the church. He should be a pastor who preaches the word and is, is faithful to the Word, and lives by the Word and the instruction of the Word. And that instruction doesn't just take place on Sunday morning. That instruction can take place in, in any manner of time. Yesterday afternoon at 4 o'clock, I was watching David Jeremiah talk about heaven. Man, it was a blessing. I, I, it was great. It was instruction that I needed that encouraged me. I need to be instructing my family. My family needs to be instructing me of the things of God and reminding me of the truths of God. Another important part of worship is fellowship. Chapter 2, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? The importance of fellowship with one another is found in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, we read, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We fellowship together. I used to think that we needed to tolerate one another. We don't need to tolerate one another. We need to love one another, despite the fact that we have differences. We are called to be peacemakers by Jesus. You know, the United Nations has what they call peacekeepers. And here's the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. A peacekeeper goes and gets in the middle of two warring groups and stands there and keeps them away from each other. There's no attempt at reconciliation. A peacemaker works for reconciliation and to bring hearts together so that the fellowship is not destroyed that God has, has given to us. We are meant to come to one another in humility and love. It's easy to love people who think just the way that you do. We actually, we, we tend to hang out with people who think just the way that we do because they make us feel comfortable and they reinforce what we have to think. But God calls us something, he, he doesn't call us just to be comfortable, he calls us to be uncomfortable, to, to reach out to those who might have a differing point of view and to love them and accept them without accepting their point of view, but giving kindness to them in their, in their discussion. I have a particular friend who has, is as far from me politically as could possibly be. And we talk, uh, we, we talk regularly. And uh, sometimes we get to a point where I have to put up my hand and say, okay, we need to stop now. 
but we talk and she listens. And I talk, she talks and I listen. I've learned things from her. She's learned things from me. That's fellowship. We encourage one another. And that's a witness to the world. In chapter 3, the verses we read this morning, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare, prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. God requires a response from us in worship, just like he did of me on the day that I described to you. The response didn't come in, re in, in regard to the music. It didn't come in regard to the preaching. It came in regard to being caught by God with a bad attitude. And I had to respond and change my response for the rest of the week and a half that was ahead. The work of God is meant to take place in our hearts as a result of coming here or as a result of giving ourselves wholly over to God wherever we are. The whole business and character of worship requires a response. It's not enough to have instruction and fellowship and sacrifice. Those are all important. And we can have the best instruction in the Word, but if it doesn't translate into an active response, if I'm not a different person for being here because of the implementation of truth into letting God work, it amounts to nothing. The Word and worship of God Almighty ought to bring about change within our hearts and lives. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Let me tell you something. I stand up in front of you and I preach. Sometimes I preach things that I preached long ago. Sometimes I preach things that I've preached multiple times. Sometimes I preach things that are, that are brand new to me. But I want you to know when I preach, I'm looking in here. And if I don't walk out of here a different person for what I have had to say, then something is wrong. I've missed the point of worship. I'm not a worship leader. I'm a worshiper. And I worship God, and you worship God, and we need to take some, something with us. The, the, last thing, the uh, second to last thing is giving, uh, uh, where God says, you are robbing from me, but you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. We are stewards of what God has given us. And that means giving back to him in our offerings. Uh, one of the sins of, of Israel was that they compromised by giving away the temple gold to appease their enemies. Sometimes it was taken forcefully. Sometimes they gave it away to appease. And the more they did, the less it bothered them to do so. And the more the people routinely held back that which was the Lord's. Our attitude ought to be different from the people of Malachi's day. Remember this, God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God wants us to be generous, not 
not just generous in our offering to the church. That's, that's important because this church does good things. It promotes the gospel here and around the world. It shares with poor people right here and shares with poor people around the world. So it's important to give to this church. But maybe it's important to take a bag of groceries to your neighbor or to, to help somebody else who is in, in need. In the, in the New Testament, they only took three offerings. They took an offering for the apostles. They took an offering for the poor. And the, the third offering was when Jesus said uh, to uh, pay the temple tax. That, that was it. But it was done, Paul says, please do it with a cheerful heart. And finally, there's hope. I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. The day of the Lord is coming. I don't know many people, young or old, who don't look around right now and say, it seems like things are building to a climax. J.B. Phillips, in his, his uh, uh, paraphrase of the New Testament, calls it the great denouement, the great climax of history is coming. And that's when Jesus returns. And that's our hope. And when I leave here in the morning, after singing the songs that I sing, if they're, after hearing the prayers that are prayed, after fellowshipping with the people that I fellowship with, I have a great hope. And the hope is that there's more than even this that God has for me. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of worship. I thank you for the privilege to stand up here and and share the, the truth of what it is to, to be a worshiper. God, make us true worshipers, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week. Whether it's with some music, whether it's, it's studying your word, whether it's putting your word into practice practically, I pray, Lord, that we would be effective worshipers of Almighty God. Thank you for these folks. Thank you for their attentiveness. I went a little long, but thank you for their attentiveness. I appreciate that, Lord. And I'd ask that you would bless them many times over for their kindness to me. Amen.